So we're going to have a bit of a look at column chromatography, which is, I guess, a more general sort of category of chromatography than paper or thin layout chromatography. So under the, under the heading of column chromatography, there are a few different types of uh, chromatographic sort of systems and processes that we can... Uh, that we can that we can that we can look at. However, first of all, we're just going to look at the general uh, the general idea of column chromatography and what this means, and sort of the general criteria for uh, for a process to be referred to as column chromatography. So, in column chromatography, we have what's called a column. So, a column. This column here is kind of like a burette that we might have used in volumetric analysis. So, it's kind of a vertical glass tube containing you know lots and lots of stuff. Now, what it contains is these solid particles here, all these little, little tiny solid particles filling up the column and they, they are the stationary phase. So they are small solid particles. And basically what they do is they, are, they fill the column and they are what we pass our sample through. So they're small solid particles. Now the mobile phase, when we're talking about just general sort of column chromatography like this in its simplest form, is just any sort of solvent that we drip on top onto the, into the top of the column and pass through the stationary phase. So this, the mobile phase comes from up here. It's just sort of, you know, whatever solvent we may be using on a particular occasion. And what we do in column chromatography is, you know, we drip some mobile, we drip some solvent through the column just to get things going, and then we put our sample. We just sit it on top of the stationary phase inside the column. We just kind of put it in the top of the column, sitting on top. What happens is the mobile phase uh, it keeps dripping on top of the sample, slowly dissolves the sample, and carries the sample through the column. And obviously, the different components in the sample are going to take different amounts of time to pass through the column and escape, depending on how they adsorb onto these small solid particles of the stationary phase and desorb back into the mobile phase. So what happens is, you know, the, com the components separate as they move through the column due to that adsorption and desorption, and then we. When, when things come out the bottom, the stuff comes out the bottom, this kind of mixture of mobile phase or the solvent and the components from this sample, we call the stuff coming out the bottom the eluent. Now this is kind of, you know, this is no one specific substance. As I said, it's a mixture of these components in the sample and of the mobile phase that we're using. And so what happens is, in order to form the chromatogram and analyze how long different components in the sample are taking to come out, we basically pass the eluent through a detector. So we might have a detector here, for example, a UV detector is one that's commonly used. And so basically in a UV detector, some UV light is shone through the eluent stream onto a detector here. And depending on what sort of substance is in the eluent at a given time, different amounts of UV are going to pass through. So different substances, you know, maybe components of the sample or the mobile phase are going to absorb different amounts of UV light. And thus as, as the, uh, as the eluent, sort of, as the makeup of the eluent changes, as different components from the sample come out the bottom of the column, different amounts of UV light are going to be allowed to reach the detector, and so we're going to get, you know, some varying readings, which which we'll be able to analyze a little bit later on. So this is sort of the broader idea of uh, column chromatography, and there's one more factor that it's important to uh, to be aware of, and that is the idea of retention time. So we know we have a retardation factor when we're talking about paper or thin layer chromatography. Well, retention time is basically the equivalent of that when we're talking about column chromatography. So as you can imagine, retention time refers to the amount of time it takes for a given component of the sample to move through the column and exit in the eluent. Now, we consider time zero to be when the sample is added to the top of the column and the sample is placed on top of the column. And so we measure the time between when the sample is placed on top of the column and when it leaves the bottom. And that, that difference, that the length of time that that takes is called the retention time. And so like the retardation factor, the retention time for a given sort of component or substance will be constant if we repeat the process under the same conditions. So if we use the same column with the same amount of stationary phase and type, same mobile phase, same everything, and we put the same sort of component in the top of the column, it will have the same retention time. It will take the same amount of time to get out the bottom of the column. So this is sort of a general outline of the ideas surrounding column chromatography. And so what we're going to do now is have a look at the two more specific categories of column chromatography. So the first time, the first kind that we'll look at is one called high performance liquid 
chromatography or HPLC. Now, if I'm going to draw a diagram of HPLC, it's going to look pretty much identical to this, uh, this general diagram I've drawn here of column chromatography. Basically, as you can imagine, because it's high performance, there is just a slight change. So whereas in regular column chromatography, we just deal with some small solid particles in the column acting as the stationary phase, in high performance liquid chromatography, the stationary phase is basically made up of much, much smaller particles. So the stationary phase is very, very small particles. And so what this does is basically if we have much smaller particles and we still fill the column, there's going to be a much greater total surface area cause or total surface area of the particles. You know, if we had one large particle filling the whole column or millions of small particles, there's going to be more surface area on the total, there's going to be more total surface area on the millions of small particles than there will be on the one large particle. So having lots and lots of small particles means we have greater surface area on the stationary phase, which means that there's going to be more adsorption and desorption going on of these components because there's more surface area, there's more surface to adsorb to. And so this, this adsorption desorption cycle is going to happen much faster and much more frequently. And because of that, basically, we're going to get much better separation of the components of the sample. And so that's why we get the high performance from these small particles make everything a bit clearer and a bit more accurate. Now because th these particles are so small and there's such high surface area, another issue that we're going to come across is it's going to take a very long time for everything to move through the column because there's so much adsorption going on. And so what we do is we often conduct high performance liquid chrom chromatography at very high pressure. So we pump the mobile phase through at a very high pressure and what that does is it speeds things up a bit. We don't, we're not sacrificing the, uh, the extra accuracy produced by having very, very small particles, but we are sort of preventing the, you know, the extremely long time that may result from having such small particles. So we pump through, we pump the mobile phase through at high pressure when we're doing high performance liquid chromatography. Now, now that we know that the, everything happens at high pressure in this form of chromatography, it's easy to get this, this HPLC acronym uh, a little bit mixed up. It's important to remember that the P here stands for performance and not pressure. So it's high performance liquid chromatography and not high pressure liquid chromatography. That's that's important to uh, have that clear in your mind. So that's one type, high performance liquid chromatography. That is a form of column chromatography. Now another form of column chromatography is, uh, is gas chromatography, or if we shorten that, GC. Now in gas chromatography, we again have you know, a mobile phase and a column, and sort of a detector and a retention time and all that kind of stuff. It's just sort of set up a little bit differently because we're dealing with gases. So this this uh, this this white coil here, this is the uh, the column in gas chromatography. So this is the column round here, and this is filled with stationary phase. And so what happens? There's two different types of gas chromatography. There is gas liquid chromatography and gas solid chromatography. And basically the liquid or the solid in these are uh, in these two different types refers to what the stationary phase is. So if we've got the stationary phase here and we look at the two different types in gas liquid chromatography the stationary phase is the liquid that is coating all this solid inside the column. So in gas liquid chromatography this column is still filled with lots and lots of small solid particles However, these small solid particles are coated in a certain type of liquid, and it's that liquid which uh, acts as the stationary phase. So that is the state. So this, the stationary phase in gas liquid chromatography is this liquid coating on the small particles. In gas solid chromatography, the stationary phase is simply the, the solid particles that fill the column. So these are often just sort of absorbent solid particles. So this is basically, in gas solid chromatography, our stationary phase is basically just the same as it is over here. It's just these small solid particles filling the column, which in this case is a coil. And so that's the, they're the two stationary phase that we, phases that we could deal with in gas chromatography. And so, as you can imagine, as it sounds, you know, we're dealing with gas chromatography. So everything happens as a gas. So here we have a canister full of gas. Basically in gas chromatography our, our mobile phase is a gas and so we call this mobile phase the carrier gas because just like the solvent over here carries the sample through the column, the carrier gas will carry the sample 
through this coiled column in gas chromatography. So we call the mobile phase the carrier gas. And so what happens is again we have our red sample here and we inject it into this red box here. And this red box is the injection port. And so how everything works is this whole region, so this this injection port and the coil and the, uh, the detector, which I'll explain in a minute, so this whole area that I've underlined with the orange here is basic is often in an oven when we're dealing with gas chromatography. And so what happens is this injection port is heated to a very, very high temperature. And so when we inject the sample into the injection port, the sample is immediately vaporized and turns into a gas. So we turn it into a gas and that way, as we let the, the carrier gas out of the canister and we pump the carrier gas through the injection port and into the coil, the vaporized sample or the gaseous sample is then is then going to be carried by the carrier gas, just the same way that the sample here is dissolved in solution. This uh, this uh, this sample is vaporized, and so now we have a gaseous sample that is kind of mixed in with the carrier gas and then carried through the column. And so just the same way that column that components of the sample are separated here, components of the gaseous sample here are separated based on how they adsorb and desorb to the uh, the stationary phase inside the column. So that. So it's very similar, however, basically everything's just converted to a gas by having everything at very high temperatures. So again, what we have at the end is a detector which detects any changes in uh, the stuff that's coming out in the eluent that's coming out of the column at the end. And by detecting changes in that substance, it can detect uh, you know, how, how the different components separate through the column. And so we've talked about how a UV detector works, and so there's another type of detector that's often used in gas chromatography, and that is a flame ionization detector, or an FID, so flame ionization detector. And so what that does is, again, this detector is also very hot, and you know, it ionizes the gas that's coming out of the column, it ionizes the eluent as it leaves the column. And by ionizing the eluent, we know that uh, ions can conduct electricity, and so depending on the on the substance leaving the column, depending on what the eluent is, uh, it's going to be ionized to a different extent, and thus it's going to conduct different amounts of current. So basically, what it does is this detector funnels some gas into a in sort of into an open space, ionizes that gas, and then sees how much electricity can be conducted by those new newly formed ions, and that's how it detects the changes and the different substances coming out of the column. So that's not too important, but it gives you a little bit of background about how we detect changes in the substance leaving the column. So there's, there's the two different types of detectors, and these are the two sort of major types of gas chromatography. We've got high performance liquid chromatography, which is just fits the standard sort of mold, visual mold for column chromatography with a vertical column. We drip solvent through, dissolving a sample and carrying it through this vertical column. Now, gas chromatography ha has the same premise. You know, we've got a column filled with some stationary phase and we pump solvent through the sample and carry the sample through the column. However, everything occurs as in the gaseous state. And so the, that's the, sort of, I guess, the main difference. And so those are the two main types of column chromatography. Now, in, in the case of each detector, each of the detectors is going to produce what's called a chromatogram. Now, a chromatogram in column chromatography is basically a graph. A graph over t of time and record a response. And so we're going to analyze how we're going to go over how to analyze these chromatograms in another, in another few videos. But just just so you're aware, what's produced in these two forms of chromatography is this recorder response chart. And so as it measures the response of the recorder as the, as the eluent passes through it, and so we might get a flat line response caused by uh, the mobile phase, which we know that there's going to be a lot of mobile phase leaving it, so that triggers a flat response. And then every now and then we get a bit of sample, a bit of the sample coming out the end of the column. So what that's going to trigger is a bit of a recorder response, so a bit of a spike there, and so then a flat line as mobile phase continues to leave the column, and then another spike as another component of the, uh, the red sample here leaves. And so that's kind of what our chromatograms are going to look like. And we'll go over how to analyze that in another video. But there, that's a basic outline of how column chromatography works.